You've probably gotten a whole pile of emails and messages from your friends regarding Biden's recent pen strokes. You might have heard something like, well, he's gone and banned this, or he's passed gun control with an executive order. Let's talk about what's actually going on and what the president can and can't do in these situations. While the host of Fudbusters is a lawyer, he is not your lawyer. If you pay him, maybe, either way you slice it, the video that you are about to watch is not to be construed as legal advice. We often hear the terms executive action and executive order being thrown around, and they're often being used interchangeably. This is a mistake, as there's a really important legal distinction between the two. Executive orders, you see, give presidents the power to create directives unilaterally all on their own. They're published in the Federal Register, and they carry the force and effect of law when signed. They're in place until another president changes it, a court reverses it, or a new law nullifies it. So let's take a look at the Federal Register. Well, we can see the Biden ghost gun stock brace business isn't quite here. That means it isn't anything that currently carries the force of law. So let's talk about that other category. Executive actions, like what Biden did at the time of this video, what Trump did to stymie our imports, and what Obama popularized during his reign, bear little weight. They aren't published in the register and aren't subject to review on their own. What they are is kind of like the sincere hope and wish of our sitting king, or president, or whatever. With the current size of the administration state, it's sometimes hard to tell the difference. Despite their relative inutility, they draw sharp ire and are often treated as though they were, in fact, law. This confusion is reasonable as executive actions don't have a very long history in our system. Executive orders, on the other hand, date all the way back to old George Washington's presidency. The Emancipation Proclamation, for example, was issued by executive order. So think about that as an example of the power of an EO. Of course, as with all things in government, the power has ballooned over the last couple centuries. Much of the president's power now comes from acts of Congress, which delegate to the president certain discretionary powers that can be accomplished with EOs. With the hugeness of the executive branch, including agencies like DEA, ATF, ICE, etc., this has exploded far beyond what was envisioned in our founding documents. Executive orders are subject to judicial review and can be struck down if they are unconstitutional. They have massive influence over the internal affairs of the federal government and can direct how and whether laws will be enforced. All that said, what Biden did was not an executive order. So let's look at what it actually was. So this is an executive action where he's basically directing his cabinet agencies, telling him what his wish list is. First up, it asked the DOJ to issue a proposed rule to help stop the proliferation of ghost guns. This is about as clear as mud, and I know we've heard many referring to this about 3D printing and such, but there's not much evidence of that. We've known for a long time that the feds have been wanting a way to deal with stuff like polymer 80s and 80% ARs. It's literally been on their wish list. So what's going to happen here? Well, they sure as hell can't just write a new law. What this is likely going to relate to is the definition of frame or receiver which the government promulgates. As we talked about in our video on AR receivers, the government is bound by the GCA which defines a firearm with the most limited component being the frame or receiver. The law doesn't define frame or receiver, so it was up to the feds to promulgate their own definition, which we've been dealing with for a few decades. Frankly, their definition is kind of clown shoes and it seems only to effectively define revolver frames, yet they've been sticking with it for all of this time. What I think is most likely is that the government will try to redraw the definition to something more vague or even specifically target incomplete components. Now this could open the government up to a legal challenge, as the law respects frame or receivers as items in and of themselves, whereas other parts of the law, it refers to a combination of parts and other more open words. That's not the case with frames or receivers, though. This, to me, means the legislative intent is only to concern completed items, not items at some stage of manufacturing. Remember also that the law is designed to set up and respect the interstate trade of firearms, not home gun building. This is something the government previously understood that it wasn't supposed to mess with, but alas, here we are. Either way, we have no idea where the DOJ is going to run this ball to, so don't freak out. Here's what's going to happen. DOJ will propose a rule and publish it for notice and comment. 
at such time, the public reads the rule and any constitutional or legal issues it poses, we bring to the government's attention in our comments. The government then has to respond to all of these concerns, and if they do not appropriately address the same, they're amenable to a lawsuit. So after the notice and comment period, time will pass and the new rule will be added to the Federal Register if all the requirements of the Administrative Procedures Act are followed. I'll stress then that what we should be doing right now is waiting to see what DOJ is going to try to pull. When they show their hand with the proposed rule, we pick it apart down to the tiniest detail. As far as 3D printing goes, I will say that I can't see a way for the feds to legally cram 3D filament into the definition of frame or receiver. So like I always say, y'all should be getting familiar with 3D printing. Not just for this, but because it's a great quality of life improvement all around. I've got an affiliate link to a printer and filament I recommend down in the description. You'll be surprised at how affordable it is to get into. The second thing here is about pistol braces, and I recommend y'all check out my earlier videos about pistol braces for a deeper dive on the subject. The letter says that DOJ, within 60 days, will propose another rule to make clear when pistol braces effectively turn pistols into SBRs. I mean, we can't be too terribly surprised here. After all, this is another thing we've known that ATF has had on their wish list for a long time. I'm also not 100% sure who really needs this guidance anyway. After all, I've just been using my trusty magic ATF ball whenever I need questions answered. Yikes. The supposed angle here is that pistol braces make a firearm more stable and accurate while still being concealable. This is a bunch of horse crap. As many of you know, the only reason we have SBR laws is because the NFA was originally going to treat handguns the same as machine guns, which are also overly regulated, by the way. They only regulated cut-down rifles to prevent people from making the effective equivalent of a handgun. Now, though, we supposedly have the most core right to those same handguns. It's ridiculous, and we all know that, but there's something interesting here. This is just my opinion, but remember when we were talking about the guidance document the previous ATF put out on pistol braces? I think it comes into play here. For the government to make an interpretive rulemaking, as they would be here, it has to be based on a rational reading of the statute and cannot be arbitrary or capricious. The fact that the previous ATF posted that guidance document might have tied the shoelaces together of the current ATF, meaning whatever their new rule, if it goes far beyond what was said in that guidance document, it might easily be attacked as arbitrary and capricious. Similar to the ghost gun thing, we can't know what's going on right now, we've just got to wait for them to publish their notice of proposed rulemaking and then pick it apart. You can be sure we'll be covering that when either happen, and you can also be sure that I'll be writing a comment of my own. Next up, he's directed DOJ to publish a model red flag law for states. This is kind of a stupid idiot nothing burger, unless the proposed model is particularly problematic. It just means the DOJ will put up a document with a proposed law and be like, Hey states, feel free to copy-paste this one, as if they weren't already doing that with other state laws. One entertaining thing here is imagining how ruthlessly the anti-gunners must be fighting to be the one to help the feds write the model red flag law. I'm sure it'll look great on the stupid appreciation plaque that they get. There were a couple more things going on here that, to be frank, I didn't really want to cover. Uh, this whole document is kind of just a presidential wish list. You all can read the document itself on the White House website. And again, this whole thing for right now is kind of just a presidential wish list. That's how it'll stay, of course, until DOJ does take action and propose those rule changes we were talking about. If they follow APA procedures and get them signed, those will hold the force and effect of law. Again, I stress the importance of waiting to see the proposed rules, reading them carefully, and writing an informed comment highlighting the issues. Now, lots of groups will give you a template for your comment. You can do this if you want, but I think the real important thing to do is your own writing, since they are obligated to respond to all the legal concerns. Last up, of course, is the nomination of David Chipman to serve as director of the ATF. ATF hasn't had a proper confirmed director since 2015, although that clearly hasn't done much to keep it from making a mess of things. You guys can read all about this guy, but I think he was a really poor choice. Not only was he adjacent to the Waco murders, he's very clearly a partisan hack, literally working with every town, the moms, and those people. No matter how you slice it, the director of an executive agency should at least appear to be impartial. Chipman smacks the least of impartiality I've seen in some time. These kind of picks are super problematic because they erode the public faith in government, something I don't think the government should want eroded any further at this point. 
Anyway, that's your quick lesson on the power of the executive branch and a rundown of the recent executive action. Again, we won't know what's going on until these notices of proposed rulemaking are posted. That's when we've got to act if we're going to do anything about it. Until then, just try to relax and enjoy your lives. Nothing has changed yet, and we simply can't know what they've got planned. The best thing we can do is stay vigilant and be prepared to take action when it's time. Let me just say I really appreciate you guys watching and subscribing. It makes a huge difference. If you want to support me more than that, I started up a Patreon and Subscribestar. I've added benefits like a patron-only podcast, a Discord, and surely more to come. This kind of support will help enable me to make more content more regularly, something I'd really love to be able to do. There's also a link to the Fudbuster sticker and the Magic ATF ball in the description below. Thank you all so much for watching to the end and for your support. I'll see you next time. Or if you join Patreon or Subscribestar, I'll see you on the Discord. Remember, the anti-side has been working long and hard passing laws and trying to make more. Anything more than minimum compliance is self-regulation. Y'all take care. Thank you.